This is a rather emotional afternoon of mixed and variable blessings. Now, do I control the slides or do I wink? Oh, there it is, okay. This is obviously a planet Earth um, encapsulated with the songs of humpback whales and blue whales. Okay. I show this picture of the interior of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine because it is part of my predisposition. As a nine-year-old boy, I was sent to the cathedral to be part of the choir school. We lived on campus. We sang. We were at voice lessons twice a day. We sang in that cathedral twice a day. And this is where I learned the language of song. I became exquisitely tuned to the reverberations in this enormous edifice. If you've never been there, I'm not religious. They tried to make me an Episcopalian. I declined and became a friend, a Quaker. But the sounds in this place are phenomenal. We would sing in the chapel behind the high altar, the boys would, and the men would be in the stalls here. And when you sing Benjamin Britten, and the only way we were communicated with by Alec Whiten, who was the master of choristers up there at the top playing the organ, was through a mirror. The organ pipes were in a different part of the cathedral. So there was a, a visual connection. And then there was the auditory delay and reflections. And the men were singing here. We were singing in the back. You had to watch. Alec Whiten give us the com conducting us singing this music at the same time, knowing that there was a delay between when you heard the men and when you heard the organ, because the organ pipes were in a completely different part of the cathedral. But as a nine and 10 year old, and then eventually 11, 12, 13 year old, your mind, you all know that this is the time in your life when your auditory system is quite plastic and things that seem almost incomprehensible now were completely, why not, right? You learn through repetition, you learn to sing, and you learn to listen. So I have always, it never occurred to me that people can't hear what I can hear. I'm not saying that in a condescending way, just that realizing there, are, we all know people who have attributes which are, I don't understand how you even saw what you just saw. Um, Katie has that attribute, watching elephants and whales. Anyway, this, was, this is the predisposition as a young boy towards music, not religion. I'm spiritual. I'm not formally religious. The first time I met Roger was in Lincoln, Mass, not too far away from here, in the summer of 1972. This was when I, he walked into Charlie Walcott's pigeon loft uh, research building. I guess we could call it a research lab. Um, a converted pigeon coop on Weston Road. And he asked me if he could borrow my pickup truck um, so that he and Katie could clean out the barn and turn it into a research lab for whales. Um, sure, here are the keys, whatever. I was 22 years old. I didn't know who Roger Payne was. I had heard about him by taking Charlie's class in animal behavior at uh, Stony Brook University. When I was introduced to the concept that you could get, because I was in biomedical engineering, so you could get three credits in a class where you got to read about and think about crickets and w wolves howling and whales singing and spiders w w spinning webs. It was like, whoa, three credits. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Little did I know it was the, it's the direction of my, the rest of my life. Anyway, about a month later, uh, Roger invited me to have dinner at their house 
down the road uh, from Charlie's. And that's when I met Katie and John and Holly and Laura and Sam. It was one of those late summer days that we're still having now when the cumulus clouds just build into the sky and raging with energy and suddenly just explode and with a torrent of rain coming down. And what happened was they all got up from the table, started tearing off their clothes and running outside. <laughs> so I did the same thing. <laughs> And the next thing I knew, we were all sitting in this patch of a garden, sort of a garden, um, where there were peas, snow peas, and we just started eating snow peas. And I thought, well, this is pretty cool. So I followed because I was pulled by the magic and the magician. Again, I was 22 years old. <laughs> That night after dinner, Roger invited me up to the third floor garret in that farmhouse and started to ask me sort of some strange questions. And he showed me some pictures of a beach in the midst of wildness and telling me stories about a place where if you stand there long enough, you know, the weather goes by you and, you know, the sand goes right through your hair and the prickers go right through your shoes. And to me, it was like, I felt like I was Br'er Rabbit, right? It was like, oh, you want to throw me into that briar patch? This sounds pretty good. But he did ask me, and this is also at the same time he was courting Bernd Verzig to come down, and Bernd was also another student of Charlie's, um, if I would come down, take a leave of absence from med school, and come on down to Argentina. I didn't say yes, and I didn't say no. So I took time off, I'm from Cape Cod, I went back home, so to speak, walked on the beach, went swimming, thought about life, and I said, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime. This is never gonna happen again, right? That's all it is, it's three months, go ahead. It's a National Geographic thing, it's cool. And then you can go back. I was interested in, my focus was on auditory prosthetics, hearing aids. Um, anyway. I came back and I said yes. <laughs> and I took a leave of absence. And um, a few weeks later, I was in the presence of South Atlantic right whales. The next memorable moment was with Roger, about seven weeks later, I'd arrived at camp. We were living in tents on the beach. Some of you know this quite well. Um, you know, in a pebble beach, penguins could come up and steal things out of your tent and pull the lines and do all kind of mischief. Um, and this was later known as whale camp. I was the very one, last person to arrive. I think I arrived after Bant and Mel. And this was the National Geographic expedition studying southern right whales in the Gulf of San Jose. Now, Gulf of San Jose, uh, sorry, Gulf of San Jose lies 42 degrees south of the equator, right? We are now about 42 degrees north of the equator. So the flora and fauna in the ocean are very, very similar, right? Not on the terrestrial part. But then one evening, soon after I got there, Roger walks into my tent, and he's carrying his mother Sony four-channel tape recorder, right? And he puts it down on my sleeping bag, and then he also brought in a stack of seven-inch reel-to-reel tapes. Um, and it pronounced that I should start using these to record the whales. I was like, well, okay. He also gave me a strange-looking tube it was a sauna buoy inside. This is what the U.S. Navy was throwing out of airplanes to uh, track the Soviets, right? Um, and I was honored when he, he referred to me as Old Bean. That, in Roger parlance, is a f form of a compliment, and it means that I had now been brought into the clan, right? I was Old Bean, right? And I didn't know what it actually what was coming next at that point. 
Um, he next instructed me to um, modify this sauna buoy thing so we, we could start recording the whales. Oh, yeah, right. I had no equipment whatsoever. I had a soldering iron and some solder, no oscilloscope, no capacitors, resistance to nothing, right? Anyway, anyway, that's the, that's the hmm moment with many of us have had with Roger. Uh, he never has spoken to me about sauna buoys or tape recorders or things like that, but I was really, really intrigued, and I was certainly not intimidated. Does that sound familiar to anybody out there? Um, it was perfectly perfect that I learned. It was perfectly perfect to be in love with the world is one of the messages I got living there. We lived in tents along this beach, ate around a campfire beneath the Southern Cross, and awakened in the morning to the sounds of southern right whales, elephant seals, and penguins. At the tip of that cliff out there, I don't know if you've seen anything like this already today, at the very tip, that's where the cliff hut was. That's now been blown away. Luckily, nobody was in it, but that's where we did all our observations. There's about a 30-foot tide in this place, so you can stand on the edge of the cliff, and at one moment, you can be looking down, you'll be just seeing hard pan and uh, um, middle of sedulous, um, what am I thinking of? Muscles. Um, and the next six hours later, you'll have 30 feet and you'll be looking right down into the nostril of a blue whale, I mean of a right whale. Whew. So it was in this magical place that Roger first told me about his um, hypothesis Yeah, this was a, one of our many contraptions. <laughs> there was also another one that you would get inside. It was a big metal death cylinder thing that would lower down, or you could be in the, uh, no, never mind. It was one of those things. But this was when Roger first told me his hypothesis that prior to modern shipping and all the noise from those ships, the songs of blue whales and fin whales, two of the largest animals ever to live on this planet, could be heard across an ocean. Now, I was pretty skeptical about this thing, about whales' sounds could travel thousands of miles in the ocean, and that the noise from ships could actually drown out those songs. But my interest was sufficiently piqued that when I returned from Argentina and I didn't go back to medical school, instead, I dove into the ocean, excited. Sorry. Excited by the possibilities of listening to and discovering the sounds of whales. So in 1972, when I was just 22 years old, Roger introduced me to the concept, concept that low frequency bioacoustic phenomena, especially the voices of large whales, could propagate across ocean basins, ocean basin spatial scales. It's not surprising that that concept sort of was just left hanging in the back room, gathering dust, right? It's almost incomprehensible to most people that a sound from an animal could travel that far, conceptually. After um, Argentina, while I was still finishing up my PhD at Stony Brook, I got a call from a guy named, um, come on, Steve. Steve, you're here, right? Yeah. Joe, uh, Jim Johnson, Steve's dad, who knew through Steve, Roger, it's a complicated thing. And uh, he asked me if I would come to the Arctic to work on bowhead whales, because they're sort of like right whales that went north and lost their makeup, right? <laughs> um, so here's what it's like to live in the Arctic uh, back 40, 50 years ago. This is 1979. 
And when anybody asks me, especially on a plane going to Texas, asks me, oh, you believe in climate change? <laughs> I say, guy, it's not a belief system. It's a knowledge-based system. <laughs> and when I first got there, the ice, the multi-year ice was 40 to 80 feet thick. We last did a survey, we were able to conduct a census in 2011, not again, because then the ice was only four to eight feet thick. When the Inupiat, we call them Eskimos, um, when the Inupiat don't go out and stay on the ice and don't hunt on the ice, what they call us tunnocks, then the tunnocks, if you want to stay on the ice, go right ahead but it's not advisable because in 100 to 200 feet of water, four feet of salt ice that's frozen is like you're on a giant water bed, right? So when someone says, oh, you believe in climate change, and I say, no, it's a knowledge-based system, just go there. It's gone. There's no multi-year ice anymore, right? Anyway, this is where I had the good fortune of working with a man named Bill Ellison. He went to MIT after graduating from the uh, U.S. Academy, took every class he possibly could here in math and physics, especially in um, underwater stuff, and uh, aced every class. And he was the one, a very practical human being. Now, I could tell stories about engineers. I happen to be one, you know, there are, but I won't go into those. We could do it at break. Um, but Bill is one of these things who's incredibly pragmatic we became lifelong friends. And it's because of Bill that in 1992, as the Soviet Union was disintegrating, this is when the senators would actually talk to each other. They probably played squash together and then drank together and ate together, which they don't do anymore. A group of senators, it was Kennedy, um, Nunn, um, Gore, that's right, and Stevenson from Alaska came up with this notion as the Soviet Union was collapsing, they asked every one of the arms of the military arms of the United States to offer up one of their technologies to look at the ecosystem of the planet. This was certainly driven by Al Gore, right? The US Navy offered up something called SOSIS, the sound surveillance system, the anti-submarine warfare passive listening system. Um, so in 1972, I'm sorry, 1992, I was uh, asked to be the lead scientist to work on marine mammals and use SOSIS to track whales. Um, so in the very first weekend where they turned the system over and said, because I'd given them a training into how to recognize the different voices, uh, it's interesting. So the first time I saw, um, the scrolling spectrograms coming out of these machines, beamform data, I'll talk more about that. Um, I'm looking at the scroll, and for these guys, time runs this way off the back of the thing, and frequency runs horizontally. So you sort of have to go like this, but then you have to go like this because time's going the wrong direction. Anyway, you know, independent variables and things like that. Um, and I noticed there were markings on this piece of paper red markings, and there was a junior lieutenant going through the, the rows of these machines, and she was showing me what it was, and I said, so what's that? Because I thought it was, maybe it was a whale? And she said, oh, that's a snapping shrimp. I, it was, sort of looked like a snapping shrimp because it came down and had a tail, and then it was repeated over and over again. I said, snapping shrimp. And I asked her again, tell me what the units are on this thing, right? What's the frequency scale? What's the time scale? And it's like, that's no snapping shrimp, expletive deleted. Or it's a really, really large snapping shrimp. It was a blue whale, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> whose signals, signals are beautifully designed for FM, like a FM, CW FM bat. Constant frequency, chirp. Constant frequency, chirp. So it buys you speed, and distance, right? Anyway, that's a whole other story. Interesting signal structures, right? So I, this is when I met a man named uh, uh, Chuck Gagnon. This is a case, and you're probably going to have to shut me up pretty soon. 
But this is a case where Chuck barely made it out of high school out of New Hampshire. Grew up in a large family, alcoholism, Catholic family. You know, you could check all the boxes, right? He says, it was the Navy that saved my life. I would have been in a penitentiary at 17 or 18 years old if I hadn't gone into the Navy. He's one of these people, not very well educated, but really, really smart. So he, he um, whatever, what do you call it? He checked out of every test they gave him. So he went into, listen, into all this stuff. He was brilliant. He is the Jonesy of all Jonesies, if I refer to Hunt for Red October. So after first meeting him, um, he was talking about how loud the sounds were and how they heard him. And I said, so um, you could tell me something about how this voice propagates through the ocean. He said, sure. He went over to a model, put a 20 hertz blue whale sound into the propagation model, sound transmission model. And he had two different depths. You see up there it says 200 feet and 1,000 feet. So he's, this is a slice through the, the western North Atlantic of the ocean, showing here's how loud that voice was at 180 dB source level, 20 hertz, 6 hertz bandwidth, how loud that voice would be at different distances. These are called convergence rings, right? It's because the sound gets refracted down, comes back up, comes down, goes up, so it's oddly. And I looked at this and I said, Holy shit, Roger's right. And that same meet, meeting, when that junior lieutenant showed me that whale that she called was a snapping shrimp, I actually took the pattern of its signals, its song notes, and found it on another place. Because the first place I saw it was a beam. It was a hydrophone array in the water which basically creates a circular pattern of high resolution sound source separation. So it was pointing up toward a particular direction. And I, she explained this. I walked over to another place in the building. I looked up at a chart on the wall. I've crossed the two beams. And I realized I was watching on a spectrogram the voice of a blue whale singing off the Grand Banks of Canada while I was sam sampling it off Puerto Rico. It was like, ah, Roger wasn't so nutty after all, was he? <laughs> the same thing here. So the US Navy is using this kind of modeling to say, how far away can I detect certain things? That was one of my insights from Chuck in their first days. The next one was when I said to him, oh, so you track submarines that are putting out a signal that's about eight orders of magnitude quieter than a blue whale. Do you think you could track a blue whale? He was like, what the, <laughs> right? Sure, so this is what he did. He tracked a blue whale, he called it Old Blue. He followed this individual throughout the western North Atlantic. You can see Florida's down there. We're up there, and the New England seamounts are up here, right? That whale came down here, headed down here, went right by Bermuda, went down to the lower basin here, came back up and stayed 10 days in, a, in this spot. We don't know anything about the oceanographics of it, but, but it could have been a cold uh, water ring. So this is where that's the convergence of what I was, uh, the concepts that I was introduced to by Roger in 1972, and the revelation that, oh, a lot of these are most likely real. So this was my simplistic interpretation of the space over which a blue whale could commu possibly communicate in the western North Atlantic pre-shipping versus shipping. Because when you're listening to the low frequency ocean throughout the North Atlantic, you cannot avoid shipping noise. In fact, you can hear anything that's going on. So when there's a seismic exploration project going off of Ireland, every one of those explosions there are no innocent whales in the western North Atlantic. They're not naive. They've heard all this stuff. Uh, the other thing that you can do with a system is you can now plot. I'm going to show you an animation. You see where you are? That's Prince Edward Island up there. Canada. Here's the Gulf of Maine. 
Cape Cod's right over there. There's Bermuda. I'm going to show you the, the uh, ecosystem space, acoustic space, in which these animals possibly communicate. Can I? Yeah, good. Thank you. These are the tracks of singing fin whales. I'm not connecting them. I'm just positioning them and putting the positions in space and time. I'm trying to give you this idea that the world of this species and the low frequency baleen whales, and in fact, for those of you interested in sperm whales, we track sperm whales all over the place, right? They're not as obscure as one would think. So that's just a little picture of the space, the ecosystem, in which these animals are potentially communicating and operating. And when I looked at this and I said, oh, I guess I've been working in the wrong spatial scale because you know, all my friends work on right whales just underneath that red dot. <laughs> you think we're going to understand this system by working in, in a really tiny space? No. The scale, you all know this if you're ecologists. If you're sampling, trying to describe an ecosystem, you better be sampling it at an order of magnitude greater than the phenomenon you're trying to observe, right? Am I out of time? <laughs> well, I'm halfway there. All right, I'll end it here. So, I don't want to take your time. I've already taken too much of your time, Katie. <laughs> I'm going to just read this last page. What I have witnessed, observed via the applications of these acoustic telescopes, that's how I refer to these systems. They spatially divide up the ocean. You can cross the beams, as in whatever that movie was, Ghostbusters. Um, the conversion of these into bioacoustic telescopes from a single unit on Hawaii to a set of units within an ocean basin or in an ocean system to networks of these multidimensional array units. So let me make an analogy. What I was introduced to in 1992 was a rotary telephone. What came up next in 1995 that I was introduced to because Chuck Gagnon became the chief operating officer of a system that's stationed over in England, Cornwall, is the early version of an iPhone, right? So it was sort of a Hubble telescope, acoustic telescope. Well, again, if you're so naive to think that iPhone 15s are the coolest thing on the planet, uh, they're not when it comes to acoustics. Right, because you can now do things with these acoustic systems that are equivalent to the James Webb telescope. And why I'm introducing it to you, yes, it might seem a little bit beyond the uh, economic capabilities. No, it isn't. For $100 million, you can build a system that you hardly ever have to repair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it gives you such resolution into the dynamics, the three-dimensional movements and acoustic activities of multiple species. I can track routinely multiple individuals through space and time, multiple species through space and time. You can now integrate that with the oceanographics, the physical oceanographics and the biological oceanographics to look at a system at a scale that is appropriate to the organism. This last slide is simply to show um, that it goes from large to small. These are diatoms. These are the organisms that are respiring and producing oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. It's the whole system. And I know that I hope that I can say, I have, if I had one wish that I could give back to Roger, actually given forward to Roger's legacy, we are, we're witnessing Roger's legacy today, Given his many gifts to all of us, it would be to actually enable the world to observe and then describe without anthropocentric bias, 
the multi-dimensional capabilities of ocean life. Thank you very much.